I don't think you can understand the China market without considering the transformational effect of, of new technology that's enabling e-commerce on an unprecedented scale. Uh, you know, in China are currently 350 million online shoppers expected to rise to more than a billion by 2020. That's only five years away. Uh, E-commerce sales already exceed 500 billion a year, growing at 35%. And that that um, uh, extraordinary growth is being felt here in Sydney at, at, at the supermarkets and discount chemist warehouse where you know, teams of what they call grazers employed by online traders stripping that infant formula off the shelf to sell it um, uh, through Taobao or, or, uh, or another platform uh, direct to consumers in China. Uh, that hit the headlines a few weeks ago. It was all related to the 11th of November, the, or Singles Day as it's called in, in China, which is a, itself an online promotional event created by Alibaba five years ago, and now it breaks world records for single day sales. Um, E-commerce is leapfrogging bricks and mortar in many ways, uh, bricks and mortar retailing in China, uh, and partly off the back of that demand for branded, imported, certified, genuine goods. Um, in fact, uh, the term e-commerce itself in some ways is outdated. It's just commerce and it's happening online. And look, I think the the um, disruptive impact of technology is is really we're really only at the start of it in the food and grocery sector. I think back to um, well, you, you look at you look at what's happened in other other industry sectors, and and the one I um, refer back to is is across the media sector. You know, my first job was a copy boy at the Daily Telegraph um, down at, at uh, Holt Street, and. Uh, and the work environment, it was manual typewriters, it was, it was copy sets, you know, pieces of paper with carbon, remember carbon paper in, in between, um, that, that they'd bash out and you'd, you'd, they'd be subbed by hand, you'd stick them in a metal canister, you'd, you'd shove it in a pressurised tube, it'd go down to the stone, the, the typesetting floor, uh, you know, liner type, you know, hot metal machines that, that wouldn't have looked out of place in, in, in Dickens, London, you know, where they put the newspaper together line by line, you know, story by story every day. Um, now, look, that's all long gone. That's in the space of my working career. It's, some of you will work out how old I am now, but... Um, and not only has that mechanical method of producing newspapers gone, but the whole media sector's been disrupted. You know, the traditional business model is gone. Um, new players, new channels. Um, if, you know, if I go into that same newsroom today, down at Holt Street, there's a television studio in the middle of that newsroom to produce video content for, for their online channels. Um, Paywalls have had to be erected around online content to try and make up the revenue lost um, because advertising has shifted. So look, if I compare that to the other job I had, well, before I left school, which was stocking shelves at Coles, and, and what happened? You know, the consumer came in, got a trolley, pushed it down the aisle, put stuff in, went to the checkout, paid for it. Now, sure, there's been technological change, you know, barcodes and self-scanning checkouts and so on, but nowhere near the disruptive... Um, Nowhere near the disruption that's happened across other industry sectors. And, you know, I think um, the power of that is going to be profound. I think we're seeing it now in markets like China where they, they um, fundamentally the difference is the last mile um, is not as problematic from a business uh, point of view as it is here. Um, but over, over time in, 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 uh, in the years to come, um, you know, that's, that's going to have a major impact and it, and it speeds, it puts more power in the hands of consumers and it creates an ability for consumers to connect more directly with uh, food processors and farmers to express their preference so, um, uh, and exercise their buying power. Uh, innovative uh, companies and farmers and processors are already tapping into this. And, of course, it also places in the hands of consumers access to far more information and misinformation about the products that they're consuming um, via you know, smartphone apps and barcode readers and QR code readers and so on. And, you know, just to reflect briefly on the uh, debate this year about country of origin labelling, um, 
you know, it focused almost exclusively on on a logo and wording to go on a printed label, and and you know, it's not a 21st century solution to that consumer information problem. Not when you look at where consumers now go to get information. You know, they they go online, they go to um, to apps and so forth, rather than squinting at labels. Um, I guess the other the other reflection, given given that. Um, Australian consumers, regardless of what they say, typically are not willing to pay more for Australian sourced product. Is you know that that effort might have been better spent promoting our product in markets where consumers will pay. Um, and the opportunity costs, of course, of um, spending tens or across the industry probably hundreds of millions of dollars redesigning and reprinting all all the labels. Uh, you know, imagine if that uh, were spent promoting product in markets. Uh, where we get higher value. Uh, look, on a more positive note, um, we think it was a good outcome uh, to get recognition of both the sourcing of the produce and the location of the, the processing. Both are important to consumers. It varies from product to product, but both are important. And so the, the design that's come up with tells the consumer both where, it was, where the ingredients were sourced and where it was processed. Uh, I think still to be tested is the level of complexity and possible perverse outcomes from the more complex wording that has to go on pack. And, um, and of course the real test will be in the implementation of that. Um, the processing jobs are vital to regional Australia. And uh, and that's that's uh, so that's why we're glad it was incorporated into the into the outcome on the country of origin labelling, and and to illustrate the importance today, we've we've uh, released a, a, a policy paper prepared by Ernst and Young for the AFGC, specifically on regional employment in the food and grocery sector. And we asked what we did was ask DY to break down those 322,000 direct jobs in the food and grocery processing sector. Uh, by every local government area in the country and map that in order to build a picture of where those jobs are. And the results are interesting. When you, when you plot the local government areas where the food and grocery sector provides a significant percentage of local jobs, they, they stretch right from far north Queensland right down to um, Tasmania and from the eastern edge of the continent right through to the Margaret River. Um, there are 14 uh, local government areas where food and grocery processing provides more than 10% of total employment, more than 10% of total employment in that LGA. Um, they're all in regional areas from uh, Hinchinbrook and Burdekin in North Queensland to uh, Leeton and Griffith in the Riverina, uh, Corowa and Indigo in northern Victoria, Circular Head in, in the northwest of Tassie, and uh, Barossa and Murray Bridge in South Australia. It's an interesting picture and, and um, I'm hoping we'll have copies of this paper to, to hand out today. If not, we'll put it up on, on your uh, website this afternoon uh, so you can have a look at it. Of course, when you add in the upstream and downstream jobs uh, to get a picture of the whole food value chain, uh, what EY found was uh, the number rises from 322,000 directly in the food and grocery processing part of the chain to more than 1.1 million jobs in the total food and grocery value chain. Um, this is the first of a number of policy papers we aim to produce with EY and the, the point of the exercise is to illustrate um, the geographic spread of economic activity in that food value chain and the benefits that flow in both directions, um, upstream to the farm, downstream to local communities and consumers uh, from growth in, the, in that sector. Just finally I want to say a few words about foreign investment. Um, because in the same way that um, opportunities for growth, jobs and higher returns lie principally, we think, in export growth, uh, so too the investment required to achieve those opportunities is more likely to come from offshore. Um, you may have seen the, uh, the business investment figures that were released by the ABS yesterday. I mean, th this is, a, this is a, a major issue. Business investment in Australia is plummeting. And it's a drag on economic growth, and, and we and we expected the fall away of um, investment in the mining and resource sector, um, but it's it's a problem that's broader than that, and and you know, we've we've done some further analysis based on the data from yesterday, 
And in the food manufacturing sector, we estimate uh, business investment currently is running at around $600 million per annum below the historical trend line. Um, now, given the growth that's happening in export markets, this is not what you would expect. It's running below that historical trend line. Um, you know, it, it, it does represent a drag on um, on the growth of the sector, and you know, it's at a time when you'd be expecting you to see a step up in that investment, not not at running below the trend line. I mean, by way of comparison, the mining sector, when that took off ten years ago, investment. Um, spiked at 10 times where it started, 10 times higher than where it started. So, look, we, we, I just mentioned that because we, we think it's not a great time to be putting more red tape or more costs or more barriers in the way of investors, including foreign investors. And we do think there's a case for uh, a targeted investment allowance to stimulate or to pull forward higher capital spending in the food and uh, agribusiness sector. And we've put that case to the government. We've done modelling, uh, had KPMG do modelling for us, which found a very quick payback. Within three years, uh, it was revenue positive. So look, finally, and um, uh, sorry if I've gone on a bit, but I just want to go back to that uh, where I started with that big uh, economic challenge facing the nation. The, the, you know, where do, where do the jobs and growth come from? Um, the, the, and it is an urgent imperative when you look at those investment figures from yesterday around unlocking new drivers of economic growth. Um, to realise the, the great potential for the food and grocery sector to pick up the economic slack and drive growth, jobs and prosperity, we need to think of it as the whole food value chain from paddock to plate and moving up that value chain is critical. It be, means becoming more attuned to consumer preference uh, because ultimately the consumer's willingness to pay will determine where the higher value returns lie. And that involves a shift in our thinking. Uh, from simply exporting the surplus to understanding uh, what the consumer wants, the consumer in China or elsewhere, what they're willing to pay a premium for and actively catering to that preference. I think we're assisted in that by harnessing the, the, the full power of new technology to improve those consumer signals right back through the value chain and by focusing on markets where our premium product is most highly valued. And look, the benefits will be shared across um, the whole country because uh, regional Australia, as the, as the work we've released today uh, highlights, uh, is really the heartland of Australia's food and grocery sector. Thanks very much for the invitation, and I'm uh, happy to take a few questions if we've got time.